Okay, thank you for your patience. We are going to get started. And with that, I'm going to introduce Tim Bird, who's going to take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session of uh, Embedded Linux Conference and Embedded Open Source. To have some representatives here from uh, the space and aerospace industries. And uh, I'd like to just do some quick introductions. Um, sitting next to me is Dr. Lenka Triskova. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, and uh, she is a lecturer and researcher at the University of Liberec here in Prague and also head of the Linux for Space project. Uh, which is a new initiative uh, around uh, creating a distribution of Linux for space. Uh, next to her is uh, David Vomlane, uh, who is lead flight software uh, engineer at Astra. And uh, if you saw the keynotes the other day, he gave a great keynote talking about some of the challenges for, for space missions. And then joining us remotely is uh, Stephen Vanderleest, and he is the uh, chief technologist for Boeing Linux, if I am not mistaken. So is that correct, Steve? <laughs> OK. So no, that's right. Uh, uh, great. Um, glad you could join us remotely. I know it's early. He's on the west coast of the United States, so it's uh, pretty early in the morning for him. Uh, but we really appreciate uh, these people getting together uh, to talk about Linux in space and in aerospace missions. Oh, and we have one more panelist uh, joining us. Uh, this is uh, Robert Bocchino uh, from NASA Jet Propulsion Labs. Uh, thank you, Robert, for joining us. I know it's early where you're at. And uh, we had just a little bit of technical problems getting him cooked up, but I'm glad he could make it. So welcome, Robert. Thank you. Thank you for having me. OK. So I guess my first question is, uh, uh, hopefully this is a softball question. What projects with Linux in space or aerospace have you been involved with? And uh, were they uh, production quality? I don't know if that makes sense in this context. <laughs> or, uh, or were they research? Or, and were they successful? So I don't know. David, you want to tell us? Sure. Kick us off. Let's see. Uh, rocket, satellite, satellite. Uh, I don't know if it ever became a satellite because I worked in a lab doing the Linux part and a bunch of guys in uniforms were in another locked room. I don't know <laughs> if that ever got launched. Uh, uh, Lunar Lander and Rocket. So that's the quick summary. They all used Linux. Uh, the first series of two satellites was successful. The rockets were successful. Well, I won't know about the other ones until a little while. The second pair of satellites were not successful. Um, and like I said, there's one I have no clue about. And unfortunately, the company ran out of money on the Lunar Lander, so we never got to launch. So, but we're not going to blame any of those failures on Linux, right? Absolutely not. Actually, <laughs> and I sweated that out for both of them, but it turned out to be <laughs> hardware guys, right? <laughs> yeah. So, Steve, how about you? Uh, what's your experience with Linux in, in aerospace? Uh, sure. My, my experience is more on the air than the space side, uh, but if we want to talk a little bit later about what those differences might be, you know, we can, we can get to that. Um, uh, I'll talk first about uh, a while back, maybe 10 years ago, I was at a small company called Dorner Works, and we were doing some work with implementing Linux for safety critical applications, especially in, in air and space, uh, but mostly research. It was looking at what was the feasibility of using Linux and what would be the cost to actually flight certify it. Uh, so there were some interesting results there that resulted in some, some good initial work. Uh, today I'm at Boeing. Uh, Boeing has used Linux in uh, space and air in a variety of applications. Uh, to date, on the civilian side, uh, certifying under the FAA, uh, to my knowledge, it has only been to level D, uh, which is one of the lower levels of assurance. Uh, the project that I'm involved with to, uh, to, to develop a, a Yocto Linux specifically for a civilian flight, we're aiming for higher levels of assurance, uh, so to get to C, B, and, and ultimately A. Uh, so that project is ongoing. Uh, we don't, you know, we'll, we'll maybe be back in a year to tell you how, whether it's been successful or not. Uh, but certainly we have extant examples at the lower levels. Uh, we're looking at what, what it would take to go to higher levels with Linux. 
Oh, great. How about you, Rob? Hi. So, um, yeah, so I work at the uh, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Been there about 10 years. And I worked on a CubeSat, a 6U CubeSat space telescope uh, in low Earth orbit called Asteria and that, that ran Linux. So that was a very successful mission. It uh, deployed in 2017, fall of 2017 off the ISS. And it successfully demonstrated um, high precision pointing for, uh, for exoplanet detection in a very small satellite form factor. So it was basically the, the smallest satellite ever to be able to, to have that kind of precision pointing. And then it was also used for several extended missions. So after the main mission was successfully completed, we still had the, the CubeSat up there and we were able to upload um, new <clears throat> software capabilities and test them um, having to do with uh, uh, advanced autonomy. So that was very successful. And then another uh, big success involving you know, Linux and space at JPL is the, uh, the Mars Ingenuity helicopter. So I didn't directly work on that mission, but I did uh, develop some of the software components that are on the helicopter because both the Asteria CubeSat and the helicopter use the same flight software framework. It's called F-Prime. So there were some Asteria components that were adapted and repurposed for the helicopter. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm, uh, I'm a bit of a space junkie. I've been watching Ingenuity with great interest. Uh, it's like the little helicopter that could. And, uh, and I know um, uh, F Prime is interesting. It's also open source, right? So completely Correct. available for people to look at on GitHub and, and contribute to. So if you contribute to F Prime, you might end up on another helicopter on Mars sometime. So just saying. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Triskova, uh, <laughs> I'll call you Lenka. <laughs> Lenka. Um, what's your experience with uh, this? Okay, uh, uh, in early 2020, I think I was consulting some CubeSats for Mission Hera, uh, which is run by NASA. And uh, yeah, we were thinking how to build up because uh, there are CubeSats, a few of them are based uh, on the computers running Linux. So we were consulting how to build it up. And uh, yeah, I started to grab the information then. And uh, yeah, we found out that there is no, let's say, common platform for uh, hobbyists interested in uh, Linux in space because plenty of people can build up a, a CubeSat maybe, uh, but there was not some, let's say, common platform. So later on, we uh, met some people who already have uh, satellites. You can see it later on uh, in the demonstrations. And we started uh, last year, let's say, to build it up. Yeah, yeah. great. So. Uh, David talked about in his keynote the other day that space is hard. That's kind of the, a standard mantra. Um, so what are some special requirements uh, that might be unique to the space or the aerospace industries uh, that other embedded Linux might have? So I, I was talking to you earlier today and I said, well, power budget. And you go, oh, all kinds of IoT devices have power budget issues. But what are, what are maybe some other things that are special challenges for, for space missions or aerospace? Well, I, I think I did co cover them to some degree, but I mean, uh, power budget is, is an issue. Generally, you have a mass budget and a power budget, and you've got to meet both of them. Um, reliability is very key. Uh, that, how that actually manifests itself in terms of how reliable you have to be and what, what time frames you have to uh, provide services depends on whether it's a satellite or whether it's something that's either going up like a launch uh, server or whether it's coming down like a lunar lander. Um, certainly those are key. Um, radiation is big, huge, and I would love it if there were a standard solution for that, both hardware and software. Uh, certainly that's something that I hope to be, well, no, that I am pursuing at present, but I hope to be able to make something that maybe we can open source some of at least. Uh, we'll have to see. Um, those are very key. Um, Another one is bandwidth, and this depends upon your particular, uh, particular detail, but um, I will say that the lunar lander that I was working on had a data rate at one point in its mission of 500 bits per second. That's not a lot of bits. <laughs> Going to be a little hard to manage that. 
Um, so it, it varies. That is, um, even in low Earth orbit, that's going to be uh, the case for quite a while until we're allowed to do things like plug into Starlink or something equivalent. I do hope that that happens soon because it will revolutionize a lot of what goes on with satellites, being able to essentially live stream the, the data down. Okay. Any, anyone else want to make a comment on any special requirements in, in your sector? Uh, I'll jump in. Um, I, not only do we have these special requirements for environment, radiation, vibration, temperature, and so forth, but also um, fairly rigorous requirements to prove that the system is reliable. Uh, that is uh, uh, providing evidence of assurance. Uh, and as you start talking about having people involved, passengers, say civilian flight operations, that, that level of rigor is fairly high. Uh, uh, you need to provide you know, sufficient evidence that we're confident the system is reliable, that is, it does what we want it to, and it's safe. It does not do what we don't want it to do, and proving that is, is, is very challenging. Um, it generally forces us to want very small footprints. Um, having too many features means extra cost to proving those features are safe. So we tend to focus on exactly what features you absolutely have to have and now prove that those are, are correct. Yeah, so w one of my questions I wrote down for later is uh, why, does, uh, why does RTOS have such inertia, uh, inertia in this space? And I think that's uh, one of the answers to that is that uh, the provability of assurance on it. Um, I, I attended a flight software workshop earlier this year, and uh, people were talking about 100% uh, coverage uh, on the lines of code in terms of testing. And uh, that's somewhat shocking for a, a project that has 25 million lines of code. So, <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, um, keep in mind though that uh, the Linux kernel has you know upwards of 25 million lines of code, but any particular implementation won't use all of that. A very large portion of Linux is, is as drivers. The next largest section is the different architectures. So on a particular system, you're only using one architecture. You're only using a very small sub, subset of the drivers. So it's not 25 million, but it still might be a million. And that's a lot of lines to prove. <laughs> yeah, actually, I mentioned one, one particular thing that comes up is there's a simple code coverage where you just make sure that all the lines are hit. But that's not actually equivalent to feature coverage which is making sure that not only do you hit the lines, but you hit them in the sequences in which they execute for real, when you're doing real commands. And that's a different thing. So it's a hard problem. It is a really hard problem. Yes, right. So, uh, okay, so it's, so it's a hard problem. So why are we here? Why, why, why should we be using Linux in, uh, in space and in aerospace as opposed to alternatives? Well, you, okay, yeah. uh, I think that uh, on the CubeSats, CubeSats uh, we have decided to use it as a payload, I mean as a not uh, mission critical system, but it brings you uh, a lot of software you may use, uh, for example, for uh, processing the images and processing the data you have, and uh, you have a lot of availability of uh, software stack, which is already existing, I mean implementation of nearly all the drives or protocols used in space, or any other protocol, and uh, also a lot of people is, uh, let's say, capable of programming for Linux, so again, uh, it's easier to hire people for the project, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> any, anyone else want to chime in? What are some of the advantages you've seen? or what? So, uh, Rob, so why did you choose Linux for the Asteria mission? So I think one reason is, I mean, similar to what was just said, it's it's just kind of an easier environment to work in. I mean, you know, you have a familiar shell, you, you have a familiar tool set. Um, and it, it turns out also that uh, if you're willing to tolerate the risk, you can actually use the shell on flight. And so we did that in Asteria. I think they also do it in the, have done it in the Mars helicopter. Um, so I think those are some of the benefits. And yeah, including also just the, the reuse of software tools, as was mentioned. One of the things I noticed, uh, and I don't, I don't know if this is true for our tosses or not, but uh, uh, people at the flight software workshop were talking a lot about AI stacks in space. 
And I was wondering, well, it's pretty easy to get an AI stack on Linux. I don't know how, how easy it is to get it on some of these other RTOSs. What types of services you need in the operating system for, for that type of processing? Um, I think the broader point is that Linux just provides a, a, a collaborative environment for innovations, whether it's AI or anything else. You, you quickly see that technology fielded by someone and then proven by, a, by crowdsourcing. So it, it gives you um, cutting edge technology more quickly. We have to prove that it's correct, um, but when we need that feature, it's there in, in Linux. And when vulnerabilities are identified, they tend to be fixed much quicker. Uh, the the um, the security side is becoming more important, especially as as we're becoming more interconnected. And so the ability to to quickly patch a vulnerability is important. Uh, uh, the Linux community, you know, the crowdsourcing effect gives us that uh, quick fix. We have to prove that that patch is safe as well. So there's always that you know, background activity of, of proven correctness, but uh, starting with uh, modern technology, starting with, with you know, the, the community best practice is a, is a great uh, foundation for the, for the work. Right. Also, I mean, I, I think that very, very much one of the most important things is the fact that there is just so much Linux out there. So when I talk about that functional coverage, about executing these particular lines in the particular order that you're gonna need them, it's kind of done that most everywhere. Um, when we come to developing uh, software space for space, and this is true in many other uh, places, but process is paramount when it comes to getting to reliability. And the clearly the Linux kernel processes, the, the testing, the fact that people do tons and tons of testing on tons and tons of platforms that exercise different things really drives the reliability up. So there are you know, very rigorous, mathematically rigorous ways to develop software. We didn't do that with the kernel. I think you know. Um, but on the other hand, we've come up with another process that produces excellent results and you know, demonstrably excellent results. So, um, so I haven't heard anyone mention real time, so I got to bring up real time. I know that uh, at least there's a perception that uh, you know Linux has the preempt RT patches, uh, but there may still be some concerns about whether or not Linux can hit real time uh, deadlines. Uh, so I have. Kind of personally, I have two responses to that. What was one is like for a CubeSat in low Earth orbit, uh, I was shocked. I, I just got into kind of space stuff this year. It's like provisioning the satellite takes months, and and so or commissioning the satellite, and so it's like it doesn't seem like there's a real time uh, aspect to that part. Uh, but are there? Is that a concern? Is that a barrier for for Linux? The the real time issues and and what types of vehicles does that apply to or what types of missions does that apply to so in in my experience on hysteria so now this was using an older version of the kernel with the preempt rt patch but i still think it's likely true today that linux is just never going to be a hard real-time os so if you have hard real-time requirements in your system that you can't miss, then don't use Linux for that. But on the other hand, I think there are many cases where soft real time is good enough. And you could also partition the system. So for example, this is what they did on the Mars helicopter. You can have part of your system, which is hard real time and is not running Linux. And then another part of your system that's soft real time and is running Linux and that works fine. Ability to split your system into real time and, and non real time is very nice when you're trying to hold down the costs because all of a sudden you just have one processor that can handle that load. Um, I'd quibble a little bit about how hard hard is in Linux real time. And really, it is, you know, if you've seen graphs of, of latency from a well tuned system, um, it actually has pretty well bounded latencies. They are higher than a real time system. Uh, Generally, so if you have a microcontroller, for example, it's going to have smaller latencies. And that's nice if you're trying to prevent something like an explosion. Um, other things, though, uh, a lot of the guidance algorithms, they have target, uh, basically tar target number of cycles per second that they want to run. But they degrade fairly in a fairly um, well-known 
reliable way, so it's sort of mathematically smooth. If you miss a cycle or two by not too much, it's actually not going to cause your vehicle to go out of control or anything. Um, so, uh, but, but there are risks. Uh, I can't remember whose talk it was, probably Stephen. And anyway, uh, it doesn't matter. The key, the important thing is what he said was, was that tune your system. Make sure that you're doing the right thing. Uh, it is at least theoretical, theoretically possible you could choose the wrong file system, you could choose the wrong drivers, and they would blow your response time out of the water. Uh, so you got to check it. There are tools for measuring latencies and stuff, and just do it. Check it out. Um, but if you do that, you have a nice, very capable system that should react pretty well. So I, I'm working on rockets now. I worked on rockets before. Uh, Linux real time, yeah, that's controlling. So I'd actually distinguish between high performance, that is, it's fast, it has low latency, quick boot up time, and so forth. And for, for me, real time actually means I can prove deterministically that even the worst case response is within my requirement. So real time doesn't necessarily mean fast. It just means I can prove it meets my, my worst case execution time. Uh, for a lot of our applications, uh, that's measured in milliseconds. And Linux can perform at that level. Um, whether I can prove it deterministically depends on not just having the, the preempt RT patch, but having that evidence that for my particular uh, use cases, even the worst case time, uh, even if it hardly ever occurs, if it can occur, I need to prove that still is within my requirement. You have a really hard, hard requirement. That's true. Um, I actually kind of steer away from that term prove when it comes to the Linux kernel. <laughs> Demonstrate. That's what I shoot for. So, uh, yeah, so when I say prove, I mean provide evidence to a sufficient level of confidence. And depending on the criticality, that that evidence is stronger or 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 maybe not as strong, but sufficient. So my experience with Linux is that the worst case times can often be pretty bad. And so maybe, I mean, maybe that could be fixed with tuning. But so I guess what I, I agree with everything you just said. So my experience is that if you have an application where you can tolerate a missed deadline every now and then, then it works fine. Um, but if you can't tolerate any missed deadlines, in, in my experience, it, it might be hard to use Linux. But. Yeah, I would agree as well. But if there is anything which is really mission critical, let's say avoiding explosions and stuff like this, then it's better to use the Artos. But uh, there are plenty of applications which are not so critical, and then you can enjoy the uh, power of the Linux and all those software stacks and stuff around. Okay, okay. Um, so we already, well, we talked a little bit about, um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch gears. So uh, I think we talked a little bit about the availability of a talent pool for, for Linux. Uh, how about development cost? Does, uh, does it cost less to develop a system on, on Linux? I mean, when, when I started in embedded Linux, we talked a lot about time to market. That was for consumer products, right, where you're trying to hit a window, trying to get a product out by Christmas or something. Is there a, are there time to market? Are there development cost issues that are considered in the aerospace industry? And does Linux hurt or hinder that? Uh, one, my, my theory is that if Linux requires less work on the operating system, uh, that maybe there's more time then to do work on the science payload or something. So uh, is that, do you agree with that, disagree with that? I, def I definitely do. <laughs> um, so um, the, the sheer massive number of features that Linux comes with means that there's, and the ecosystem overall, so you have a lot of other things. Uh, including one satellite running Python, which surprises a lot of people I talk to. But um, so it was a science satellite, and they wanted to analyze real time and just send down uh, just a little bit of data, that bandwidth issue. But what I find is that uh, it is pretty easy to find some really sharp Linux people. And if you find somebody really sharp, actually the aerospace, they may or may not have an aerospace background. Most of the people I hire um, probably at least three quarters do not have a previous space or aerospace background. But they come in, they know Linux, uh, they, you know, they're going to work with people who are experienced with space, and uh, it works out pretty well. Um, 
there, you know, I've hired a lot of really sharp people. So, yeah. any other any other comments on on the development time or cost of development? Is it less or more with Linux, or is it hard to say? Depend is it project dependent? Less. <laughs> well, I, I think we already mentioned this, but I, I think if you have developers that know Linux, then I would imagine it's it's less, right, than having to train them in some other environment. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about regulations, um, and I, you know, if you have to prove, well, and in particular, one of the regulations I saw, uh, or I thought I saw, was about the process used to develop software, and and you know, Linux has not followed that process from day one, uh, you know, a rigorous design first process, um, and so um, does. Is it, does that mean it's impossible to, to certify Linux for certain space applications? Is it just a non-starter or is it something we can work on? I think, Steve, you said that you're kind of working your way up certification levels. Yep, that's right. Well, it's not impossible. We have examples uh, of, of Linux being certified at, at fairly low assurance levels. Uh, and uh, it's a very hard problem, but we don't think it's impossible. Uh, it's, it, re it requires some innovation. Uh, uh, it's, it's possible. Um, the the fact that Linux has been um, developed by a community does present its challenges because, uh, for example, the O178C guides uh, a civilian uh, flight certification in, in the U.S. Uh, in it expects that there's that process in place that you start from requirements which drive a design which drive code um, and and of course Linux hasn't been that um, process driven uh, but there are guidelines in place from the FAA and others about how you would reverse engineer those artifacts because there is a design to Linux it's just emergent there there are implied requirements for Linux and you can tie those to your particular operational requirements so there is a way to do it um, we think and we're we're driving towards that oh that's great All right. we have one you know it's it's a potential competitor so I shouldn't name names but there is a large rocket company that you're very familiar with, which is launching people. And they are based on Linux. They have a two-tier system, which a lot of the systems are in space. So you have a Linux sort of at an executive level. And then you have uh, microcontrollers handling the things that you, know, you really have to have a lot of responsiveness. But um, so this unnamed company has broken a lot of ground, and they are flying people. Um, you know, we we can name them. It's SpaceX. <laughs> I didn't say it. Uh, so uh, I, I believe Rocket Lab uses Linux. I know that Astra uses Linux, and we've been using Linux. So uh, now we are not human rated. Human rated is that's basically as high a bar as you can get. And they spent years and years with NASA to get them confident on what their architecture was and whether it would be safe. Um, but obviously, they've demonstrated that. Um, and uh, I, I think we're all moving forward. Uh, in theory, I, I too, I'd love to, that it was developed with DO-178, strict, strictly adhered to, but it isn't. On the other hand, it's really reliable. Uh, and maybe somebody will, no, somebody will never reverse engineer it. <laughs> and it's in C, so it's essentially unprovably, it's unproved, you can't prove it correct. Uh, so that's un an unprovable thing. Well, there is, there is a new runtime verification system uh, in the kernel. Yeah, just, and just got accepted. So, but but the the cell four folks know how difficult it is yeah. to actually it's, do uh, mathematical type it's verification. It's a hard problem. It's a very hard problem. Well, I don't. I want to hog uh, all of the questions. So uh, we should have another mic somewhere in the room. So if you have a question, uh, raise your hand or let us know. Or maybe, maybe the best thing is we've uh, got a stand over here. If you could queue up if you've got a question or raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I've got more questions. I could be here for a long time because uh, I find this super interesting. Um, OK, so any questions right off the bat? If not, I've got one. Um, so what about COTS in space? 
Okay, so one thing that I was really struck with at the satellite presentation yesterday was uh, they're using COTS, co uh, commodity off the shelf or consumer off the shelf or whatever that C stands for. Um, but it was uh, carefully curated, right? They uh, went through a bunch of iterations to select parts and then test those parts to make sure that they were space worthy. Uh, one, does that count as COTS? Uh, I think it still does because you're leveraging you know, an ecosystem that produces parts that are cheap. And does, does that really matter for space missions? I mean, space missions are so expensive already that like if you shave a few cents off a, off a processor, does that matter? I mean, it does for radiation hardened, and I, I think it mattered for ingenuity, uh, but uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? I feel like I keep going first. <laughs> COTS is good, because you can lay down them and get a little nap in space. <laughs> that is not what you were talking about. Okay. Um, COTS matters a lot. Uh, I mean, there's, like any market, there's upper end and lower end. And Astra is lower end. So um, we aim to be very, very inexpensive, uh, as well as highly responsive. But that expensive is a big piece. And when we have a choice between something which is COTS and something which is radiation hard, we're looking at something which is a few dollars for an FPGA versus $30,000 for an FPGA. So even though space is expensive, you get a few of those, it really adds up. And we're, you know, part of our low cost stuff is high volume. So that hardware, you can't amortize that cost over some, some rocket you pay at each and every time you launch. Um, we certainly do uh, qualification. The biggest thing is radiation. Uh, we love to use automotive grade parts because those have generally been burned in, which is, uh, you know, a lot of the, the early, um, what are they called, uh, I think newborn failures. Um, those happen, they weed them out of the supply of chips. And so you have things which are not likely to fail, at least under normal conditions, and then we check them out some more. Um, it is interesting to note that sometimes those, you know, orders of magnitude more expensive chips are in fact the same chips off of the same die, uh, if you know how they make uh, integrated circuits. Um, they've just been tested a lot more. Um, and then they mark it up and we pay it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's worth mentioning, um, maybe 20, 25 years ago, there was a shift from having customized processors where it wasn't just simply selecting for reliability, but it was actually designed with um, redundancy and so forth built in. Those specialized processors were incredibly expensive and hard to keep uh, updated. And so there was a shift to uh, commercial processors at that time. And then the redundancy that we needed was built at a system level. And so instead of building redundancy into the chip, you use multiple chips. And so if there's a failure in one, you, you had redundancy that, that others could, could take over. And, and that reduced the overall system cost and it provided innovation that we could tap into the volume production of processors being used for automotive or, or other industries. Uh, so that was the case for, um, for, for hardware, for computer processors. I think the use of Linux is trying to follow a similar uh, path rather than having a specialized operating system that is hard to keep up to date, that's, that doesn't enjoy the, the, the volumes that, that, you, that you might see otherwise. We get the benefit of crowdsourcing for Linux and we have to figure out how do we build safety and reliability on top of it in some way so that we can get the benefit and get the safety and reliability we need. Yeah, I'll, I'll note that uh, the Starlink design, which uses a number of Linux processors, uh, is using, I think, configurations of six processors, uh, you know, a, in a fault-tolerant configuration. Uh, and they seem to have done okay with that in terms of reliability, so. Yeah, it's a really important point. I mean, what, what he's talking about, there were, for example, to go back into history, um, those processors, there are certain mathematical attributes that will let you tell you whether a multiplication of two numbers is correct, but, you know, without ha having to double the number of uh, transistors that you need to do that. So that, that's what people would do, and they do that for addition and subtraction, every, every operation. It's nice, it's really cool, and it's also very difficult, and the math, you know, not everybody has that level of math. It's pretty picky, and it can... You have to add on top of that all the glue, 
of everything together, which is very difficult to come up with um, uh, proofs that that's correct. And I mean proof in a mathematical sense. So what we've done, uh, and this is really cool, uh, is it up-leveled that so that processors check processors. So they run things in lockstep, for example. Uh, that can be done in software or in hardware. And it turns out if you're designing uh, uh, hardware to be fault tolerant, there are, uh, I did a quick check uh, a few months ago, there are at least five manufacturers that provide lockstep processors. So it's two processors that check each other. They're, these are microcontrollers, so they're not full-blown processors, but I'm hoping that will emerge soon. I'm hoping that might come out of the HP spacecraft computer initiative. Um, but uh, uh, that, what that does is that lets you just take some off-the-shelf stuff and have it be highly reliable you can combine, combine two lockstep and therefore self-check processors. So take two of those things, and one of them, you know, the, the probability that both of them fail is really low. So that's really, really cool. Yeah. yeah uh, uh, the other comment uh, what I've learned when we were uh, consulting the Hera mission is that uh, I did grew up in automotive, and if you are building a hardware in automotive, you are counting every single cent. And uh, the main physicist of the mission told us, oh, those cubes, as they cost nothing. It's just, I don't know, a million of euro. <laughs> because the main uh, satellite was costing I don't know how many. So uh, if you are building a hardware for the, such an expensive mission, then you spare money for expensive hardware. But they, are, they were looking to CubeSats. It costs nothing. So maybe we can have two, four. And uh, you buy cheap hardware, from their point of view, you buy cheap hardware, I mean, at least automotive proven, and uh, you simply have two boards, yeah. ten boards, <laughs> because it, from their point, yeah. it, co it costs nothing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or if you want to go ultimate, you could have two satellites. Yeah. <laughs> people do that. Some people do that. Okay, uh, we're getting close to the end here. Any, any questions? Okay, John, you want to... Thanks. Uh, this is actually maybe a little bit more of a comment, but uh, as someone who is uh, part of the, the real-time Linux uh, development team, I, I just wanted to clarify, I've actually heard it a couple times at, at the Zephyr group here, that the real-time Linux team is committed to hard real-time, real so we don't uh, by any means consider it soft real-time. So a single missed deadline is a completely failed system, right? So, and we actually believe with our preempt RT patch that we have a hard real-time system. So if you know, someone is unable to you know, have this re reliability, then it's probably misconfigured, as we've mentioned here, or it's been incorrectly implemented in user space in the applications. And really, the preempt RT community wants feedback. We want people to help people, because we really are interested in hard real-time. We don't want to hear this word soft real-time. And so really, I would also encourage the space uh, people, if they, if they don't believe it or they're having problems or their proof of concepts aren't working, they should reach out to the preempt RT community because we have a real-time kernel that we're working on, really. That's all I wanted to say, sorry. Not really a question. Okay. <laughs> you got your... <laughs> any, any other questions? Okay, I've got, I've got one last one uh, that... Uh, I don't know if, how interesting that is, but you know, Linux has an open source license that requires uh, distribution of source code uh, to all of the uh, people that you give the binaries to. Uh, so I'm not sure how much that applies in space missions. <laughs> uh, there's, there's no one on Mars who received the Linux kernel binaries, uh, but how much, how much does the license, does the license have any impact on how you use Linux, or how you archive your source code, or uh, what? How, how big of a factor is the the license, or in particular the GPL, to to space missions or aerospace? <laughs> uh, GPL talks about conveying, so giving the software to some other organization, which conceivably is why you actually don't have rocket companies, you have launch services companies. So nobody sells the rockets. Um, at Astra, we do not really 
have anything special with the colonel, and I would be delighted to give back. Uh, there are a few areas that um, hopefully I'll get to at some time, and would be delighted to, get, to give that back. Um, and actually, we, our team is encouraged to participate in the various open source communities, because although we have restrictions on things that we can talk about, uh, legal governmental restrictions, something called ITAR, um, yeah. And others. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we want to. We, we really want to play good. You know, we want to be good. Good open source citizens. Okay, uh, we're just about out of time. I want to thank everyone. Uh, I know especially uh, Rob and Steve on the on the west coast of the United States. It's uh, pretty early in the morning over there, uh, but I really appreciate you taking the time, uh, all of our panelists, to uh, come and talk to us about uh, Linux in space and aerospace and some of the challenges. And uh, actually. Uh, I think the latest statistic that I saw was that uh, about 50% of CubeSats are estimated to use Linux today. Uh, it's kind of a hard number to get. I wish people were, were more open with what they were running on their flight stacks, but, uh, uh, but uh, I think we have a bright future. And hopefully, if there's, uh, as people get involved with community, hopefully we can address any, any uh, concerns or any issues that, uh, to make it even, even more amenable uh, to this industry. So thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you. Yeah.